Well, you know what? When I was in the academy, there wasn't much training on it, believe it or not. You know, there wasn't much training. There was, I think, a, a quick one or two day course that we just quickly reviewed about stuff like that. We have that. to hold ourselves accountable. We, we have to hold each other accountable. That 3% of campaigns were duplicates. Now, what that means is we can't identify through a data poll which ones are fraud, right, or scams. But we can identify through a data poll that you, Lou, were doing a fundraiser for Cali and me, Robert, was doing a fundraiser for Cali also. Mm. All right, this is Lou Pimber here with Lou Pimber Speaks. Uh, so excited today because uh, our guest today, Mr. Robert Garland, uh, NYPD. He's actually one of NYPD's finest. So if you've never seen one of NYPD's finest, you got him here today. Uh, take a look at the guy. He's got the beard. He's got, he's got the good looks. He's got the youth, man. It's an honor to have you here today. Also, Mr. Garland is the uh, CEO and founder of a project called Fund the First, which we'll be talking about today. Very unique uh, I've gone to the website, Fund the First, and and uh, checked it out. Man, you guys are doing great things. You know, welcome to the show, man. And and uh, I'm so honored to have you here today. And I appreciate uh, having been introduced to you. Uh, so tell me a little bit about uh, Robert Garland, man. Who 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 was Robert Garland uh, growing up, man? I know. I, here's what I know about you. Number one, you got a brother who's a baseball player, right? Yes. Number two, your 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 dad was a cop back in the day. Yeah. All right, and so. Uh, what led you into law enforcement, man? What was that? Was it what dad was doing it? And what, how, did that, how did that come about? Well, first, Lou, thank you so much for having me on the show. The honor's all mine. Trust me. Honor's uh, all mine. I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So every boy always wants to father, uh, follow their father's footsteps, right? And that's for what sure. I did. When I was young, all I heard was stories of my dad in narcotics doing these crazy things, you know, from, <laughs> from the day I was born, basically, until I was 10, 11 years old. He ended up retiring uh, when I was around 10. 10, 11 years old. He got three quarters from the job. He got hurt while in narcotics. Um, but that was always a thing. I wanted to be just like my dad. So I did go on to play baseball. I played Division One ball out here on Long Island in New York at, at New York Tech. Unfortunately, they disbanded their baseball team recently because of COVID and everything. Horrible. Mm -hmm. Horrible to see all these players that happen. But uh, after playing there, I had an opportunity to play pro ball. And I sat down and I spoke with my father. And my father said to me, he said, you got to make a life decision. What do you want to do? And I said, well, let's weigh everything out. I said, I can go and play farm ball for six, seven, eight years yeah. and then become a cop afterwards. And then who knows what happens? Or I go in now and I advance my life and I start my life. And luckily I did take that advice. I started my life and that's how I met my wife. And I would never regret those days ever. Right. But, you know, baseball was everything, but also seeing what my father did. I wanted to be just like him. And luckily, you know, I got his shield when I became a detective, you know, so it was really cool. We followed the same path. We were both in narcotics. So it's, a, it's been a great experience. But again, you know, being able to meet my wife on the job and I would not take that back for any second. Right on, man. I love that. So your, your wife is a, is a law enforcement officer as well. Yes, she is. She's working right now. Right on, man. So, yeah. so where did you meet her at? At one of the precincts or how, how did you meet the, what is her name, by the way? Vanessa. 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 Where'd you meet Vanessa? So funny story. I saw her in the academy. Okay. And I saw her across the hall. And, you know, you just get that feeling when you, when you see, you know, you're married, you, you get that feeling, you know, you know, yeah. it's just going to happen. Eventually it's going to happen. Right. And we ended up going to the same command right out of the academy. Okay. So six months in, we went to the same command. We went to a command called Midtown South and we were working nights and I was dating someone. She was dating someone at the time. We both happened to break up with them at the exact same moment. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to ask her out. I'm going to force her to go out with me because that's what cops <laughs> do, right? <laughs> You're under arrest. <Yeah. laughs> so I forced her to go out with me basically in Times Square. I was working a, a fixer post and uh, it was like a, a, we'll call it a punishment post. I don't remember what I did, but I was in the middle of Times Square and I couldn't leave a five by five box. That was it. Okay. So um, I'm standing there in the middle of Times Square and I texted her. I said, you know, I'd like to, you know, ask you something. Come meet me over here. She walked over and then that was it. You know, that was it. 
Now and three kids said, later, three kids and 10 years later. <laughs> and she's still <laughs> thinking about it. She's still thinking about it. So let she's me tell you. Pro- <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you made it past probation, I assume. With, with, yes. with your wife, with your wife. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. So for those who aren't familiar with, with law enforcement in New York, when you come out of the academy, um, you're not in a patrol car. You're on a, on, a, on a walking beat in a fixed post, as you call it. Tell me that process. So the job's changed a lot, and I have 13 years on the job now. Okay. And it's changed a lot. In, I mean, you know this. Every 10 years, it's massive changes. You know, everything happens, even less than that. But in my time, when I first came out, we did a unit called Impact. And everybody out of the academy was on streets in different impact zones. So okay. we had Midtown. Midtown, they call it Midtown Soft. But listen, it was busy there. You know, it was there were a lot of stuff going on there, especially the nights working eight to, eight to four in the morning. You know, a lot of 42nd Street got very, very busy, especially with Dallas BBQ over there. There was a lot of fights, a lot of basically everything. You name it, it was there. But yeah, we were out on the streets. Now they disbanded Impact. And basically when people come out of the academy, they're going right to a precinct and they're getting into sector cars right away. There are a lot of foot posts still, but it's not like it was back 13 years ago. Got it. Got it. And generally, how long does it take for you to get into a patrol car or other type of assignment? It all depends. I mean, there's specialized units, obviously. My career progressed in a different way. Uh, when you're an impact, when, not, when we were an impact and the way it worked, you had to wait until basically a new class would get out and other precincts were accepting new cops. So I ended up spending an impact. I was there for a year and a half. Okay. So Midtown South, I was there for a year and a half. Transfers came down. I ended up going to Midtown North Precinct, which was okay. northern, north of Broadway, uh, north of, uh, what was it, 50th Street, whatever, 47th Street in Midtown. And my wife ended up going on the east side to the 17th Precinct. And when I was in Midtown North, I would, you know, you go right into a sector car. So that was right in. So within a year and a half, well, two years on the job, I was into a sector car. And actually by year four, I was an anti-crime. I was, I was a worker. You know, I went right onto the streets, you know making a lot of arrests. You guys can look me up in the news. You'll see from way back when putting freaking Pinocchio in, in handcuffs in the middle of Times Square. <laughs> Is that you? <laughs> yeah, was, you can see all those those wild stories. But uh, yeah. a, lot, a lot of goose chases up there. It was fun. It was, it was a lot of fun. It was quite an experience. Um, but then from there, you know, I wanted to excel my career and I had a lot of arrests and, you know, the aspirations of following my, following my father's footsteps. I went to narcotics, you know. Got it. And, and uh, so to get into the narcotics, you had a, how did you earn your bones to get in there? How did you earn your spot to get in there? Tell me about that. Um, it is an interview process. You have to yes. interview. You have to be an active cop. I mean, having that little bit of a phone call always helps. And that's yes. like any, any, anyone on the job, if you want to get into a unit, you know, getting a little, little extra push always helps. But uh, I got in right away. And I actually, originally, they said I was going to gang. And then I ended up going to narcotics. But then I ended up going to gang a couple of years later for a brief, brief amount of time where I ran a gigantic wire case, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. 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 Those are fun. Yeah. It's very similar. I, I worked narcotics out gangs as well, undercover in a gang unit and then mm-hmm. in, 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 a, in a task force as well. And uh, your, your narcotics work, uh, was it in a, in a undercover type squad or conspiracy squad? How did you guys run the, your ops over there? Yeah. So like I said, I'm still active, so I'm not going to give up too, too much of how the inner workings are, mm-hmm. but you're basically going out, you're out on a field team and you do have undercovers, you know, we're buying, you know, buying drugs. I was not an undercover. I was an investigator. However, in Manhattan and actually in all, all narcotics uh, uh, units throughout the city, you're, even though you're investigators, you're working in undercover capacity, you know, you're in the streets, you're doing everything. That you yeah. We're not so we're buying, but uh it was fun. I mean, listen, there were a lot of people that we put in jail and a lot of long-term cases that I'll yeah. never take back. It was, it was, it was definitely a learning experience and it actually helped me with my business career, believe it or not. Okay. Got it. Oh. Very cool, man. And, and so you're, you've been on 13 years and you're currently a detective. Yes. I got promoted in, oh man, I don't even remember what year. I went to narcotics in 14. I got promoted in 16. And now I'm working. I got hurt. Um, I got hurt in 2019. Um, and then for the past year, I got transferred to because of my injury. I can't. I tore my shoulder. I have two anchors in my shoulder mm. in narcotics. Yeah. Not, not fun. You know how injuries go. Yes. Um, yeah. But uh, not fun. And uh, I've been in the missing person squad in the 13th precinct. So I handle missing persons there. It's, it's not like you think it is. A lot of runaways. 
for the most part, it's a lot of yeah. just runaway kids. The people go to New York and they go try to escape, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's I, for sure. I've been to Manhattan a few times and uh, I, it's just so such a different dynamic than out here in the West. It's very different. Uh, just the way people live, the mm -hmm. lifestyle, the speed, it's just very different, man. So uh, I'm very impressed with the cops out there. I've met a few from the, from the air squadron, the, the helicopter pilots and stuff like that. Very sharp guys. And so, oh, yeah. and so, uh, man, thank you for your service, man. Thank you for being out there. It's a tough time being a cop today, you know? And so it's, it, it's always tough. It's always a tough time being a cop. I'm sure when your father was a cop, there were those challenges then, you know, uh, in the eighties, there was those challenges in the nineties. And today we have our challenges today. So uh, I appreciate you being out there along with the men that you serve. And so thank you so much for being out there, man. I really do appreciate thank it. And you. Your thank you. And your wife, of course, it. as well. Of course, your wife as well. She's now, out there protecting the mean streets of Brooklyn right now. Uh, <laughs> well, a little hectic out there. Is she. it? Man. Yeah. Man. I, I, I can only imagine what, being out there. Again, I've been out there during the, the, the Christmas holiday type type of time. So mm -hmm. so it's even then, as cold as it is, there's a lot of hustle and bustle going on. Oh, yeah. Out in the Manhattan area. So listen, you know, one of the things that, that I wanted to talk to you about, you know, it breaks my heart every single time I hear of a police tragedy, you know. And so, you know, and lately I've heard a lot about over the past couple of years, a lot of this uh, uh, police suicide, you know. And so mm -hmm. and, and so, it, it, you know, it, it just. What I've noticed that in California, Florida, New York, and Texas, it typically has the highest rates of police suicide. On average, about 10 per year or so is kind of what I found out. You know, um, have you, over the time in law enforcement in the past couple of years, what, what has been done within the PD to, to address that or to identify that or to cope or to deal with that? It is, it's, it's a horrible situation. It, it really is. And you know what? We have to always remember that one another and all of us that work with the, with each other we're all there for one another you know we're seeing some horrible things in the streets right but then we're also going through nonsense in the office nonsense in the squad with people we work with and sometimes people don't want to talk about things that they're going through right you know, and they bottle everything up for way too long so there are there's a ton of nonprofits here that do handle suicide awareness but there's also um within the department we have different units we have papa uh, Papa is a hotline that you could call and you could help out with the NYPD um, if you're going through something and you do need help. Okay. Um, there's also uh, early intervention. So there are plenty of units that the NYPD does have, but what's the problem? There's always a stigma that goes along with it. Right. You know, right. always fighting the stigma. And a lot of people are very afraid to ask for help because they think that if they're asking for help, they're the bad guy. And that's Correct. not the case. That's you not know, the case. In law enforcement, what well, sometimes what people forget is that, you know, cops uh, out there on the on the beat, on the street, uh, working those late shifts and, and all those various hours, you know, they see abuse at varying degrees uh, from elder abuse to child abuse, to just every day, just abuse. Uh, they see a lot of death and, and, and death has many, many faces, uh, varying levels of death from, you know, decomposing bodies to a, a, a suicide just occurred type of thing. Or, or just murder and just these heinous crimes that you wonder how can someone do something like this, you know? And, and you're absolutely right. They take that, they take it home. They may not go home and discuss it, but it stays with them, you know? Accidents that where people die in these, in these horrible, these horrible deaths due to accidents. And, and one of the things too is that, think about the job. Every day you go to work, these cops, they're putting on a vest. They're putting on protective equipment. So it's a constant reminder that they have to live with that their life is in danger. There's always danger looking around the corner. And what I tell guys is, listen, you want to act nice, but think mean, because that person you're talking to may be very nice to you until the moment they decide they want to kill you. So when you live that way for so long, for so many years, every single day, several hours a day, it's got to wear on people, don't you think? You're living on edge all day long. You're living on edge, you know, and especially in different places where you work. And I mean, listen, I had, the, even though I was in narcotics, we were in a close knit team. We were in the office a lot. We we're out on the streets and we weren't interacting with the community, so to say. My wife, she's out there interacting with the community day in and day out, and she has to watch her back, you know, and there's hundreds and thousands of cops that are out there doing the same exact thing. So it's, it's really important to be able to speak about what you're going through. 
you know, find somebody that need that you could rely on and speak to them. And you know what? Also, it's it's important for us as as peers that work with people to recognize those early signs, people shutting out, you know, shutting out, shutting down, not talking to anybody anymore, disappearing. Those are the people you need to go to and start speaking with. You know, or, I notice uh, in law enforcement, your first two, three years, everything's good. Right. And all of a sudden uh, the attitude changes. Everyone's uh, 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 for lack of a better term, er everyone's an Adam Henry, except for you. Right. And sometimes <laughs> you're the Adam Henry, you know what I'm saying? And so, yep. and you have to just recognize those signs. Uh, what, what training is out there to help the officer Academy training to help them identify those signs of, Hey, listen, you're starting to shift mentally. You're starting to see things from a different lens. Uh, what what is that? what's out there? Well, you know what? When I was in the academy, there wasn't much training on it. Believe it or not, you know there wasn't much training. There was, I think, a a quick one or two day course that we just quickly reviewed about stuff like that. But there's plenty of courses that you could take that are out there that are available through a lot of nonprofits. Believe it or not, a lot of okay. nonprofits offer these type of early intervention trainings to bring on awareness. I know plenty of them. If anybody wants to reach out to me personally, I mean, by all means. You know, I could definitely uh, lead you in the right direction, but departments do need to basically have those programs there and enforce them a little bit more. You know, that's just my opinion. No, you know, I agree, man. They, they, there's, there's a, dem, uh, such a demand on, on, for police to be, to be the, the, the we're, we're, we're problem solvers, you know, we're counselors, we're the, the babysitter, you know? Uh, we're the first responder to help stop the bleeding many times, you know? And you know what, to be honest with you, we're there to take the shots. The cops are there to take the shots. Literally speaking, take the shots. And oftentimes they have to deliver the shots. And, you know, uh, there's a lot place, a lot of responsibility placed on that officer today. And it's always been that way. So it's, it's definitely a, a, a pressure that cops have to live with. And, Look, you mentioned there are resources available. Uh, what's one of the resources available that officers can can reach out to if they have questions on stuff like that? I can post it up here. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. There's actually a, a couple of local ones that we're partnered with through my company, of Fund the First, and I know we'll we'll talk about this later. Yeah. Um, but there's there's one called First in Wellness. Uh, they're a company. They support a lot of that kind of stuff. There's Project 109. There's Beyond the Badge New York. So that's just three, and that's rattling off the top of my head. There are plenty, plenty of plenty of different nonprofits and even companies that really do specialize in this and give you the resources that you do need. But here's the challenge. You mentioned it earlier, to get people to make that phone call, man. Yeah. You know? It is a challenge because it's breaking through that stigma. Yeah, it's a challenge, man, and, and it's tough. I remember in a situation similar to that where it was pretty bad, and they, the, the guy says to me, hey, listen, there's a good chance that, and this was in passing. It was no counselor, okay? It was like, just so you know, uh, you may later on see someone that looks like that guy. Don't worry. It's not really him. It's just, you're gonna, it's just the way your body, your, your memory works. And I'm like, you're crazy, man. You're crazy. And sure enough, man, one day I'm sitting there and I see a guy and I'm like, that's that guy. Who, he, this guy huh. passed away. And, and I was like, I am so thankful that they at least shared that with me so that I didn't think I was going crazy. And, right. I, kept, and I kept seeing this guy in other people's faces and had that passing little bit of advice hadn't been shared with me, I would have thought I was losing it. Mm -hmm. You know, because number one, it was extremely violent. Uh, it, was, it, it was a horrible way to go. And um, I'm physically involved in that situation. And so... Um, it doesn't leave you. Even talking about it today, your body starts to react as if you're there because your, your body physiologically doesn't know that you're not really there. The, mm -hmm. Your body's processing as if you're there. And so it's those adrenaline dumps that over time that eat you away, you know, and, 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 which, and which leads to, to the, the number of law enforcement that's that, that people aren't even aware occur every single year. I mean, I think in 2020, over 264 cops died horrible that's a lot of officers dying from gunshot wounds accidents just from the hazards of the job and that doesn't even include officers who died post-retirement mm -hmm. you know right behind me i have two pictures of two amazing undercover narcs that i'd worked with and with all due respect to them and their families you know donnie and danny 
they've since passed on, but it was from just the rigors of the job. And, and so often those numbers aren't included in those statistics. You know, the job doesn't leave you. The hazards of the job doesn't leave you. It doesn't leave your heart. It doesn't leave your soul. And, and, and the habits that you pick up working in those type of dangerous assignments sometimes don't leave you either. You mm-hmm. know, uh, it, it's 2021. And I think we're at about 143 deaths so far for law enforcement. You know, and so it is a, it is a hazardous job. And I get it. We volunteer to be there. I get it. Um, but it doesn't mitigate the fact that we should still address it and we should still offer help to people, help to officers uh, in dealing with those, those type of situations. You know, um, I remember a time when when I was interviewing for the job, I think it was I came on in 08 and I started the interview process around 06. And I remember saying to my father, I said, you know, I'm, I, I'm nervous coming on the job. It's dangerous. I don't want to get into a, a gun battle or something and something happened to me and, you know, pass away or whatever it may be. And he said, well, let's look at the statistics. And then it, it was rare. You right. never heard about this stuff. And now it's, you hear about it every single day. Right. And that's too much. That's too much. And you know what? I don't like to get into politics and all that kind of stuff, but it's because of respect. A lot of that stuff goes out the window with right. us. You know, it's about um, mental health. You know, it's about a lot of illnesses coming out, people not taking care of themselves properly. You know, there's a lot of factors now that have changed in only, you know, how many years? 20 years almost. You right. know, it's a lot of different factors in today's day and age that we all have to be conscious of. And there's ways of fixing them. There really are ways of fixing them. What do you suggest? Well, well, again, I'm not going to get political on that spectrum. Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> even all politics aside, putting that aside, look, there's always a root cause of these problems. Oh, of course. By the time a, a, a 11 year old kid draws a knife on someone or assaults somebody and then and then escalates to assaulting a person of authority, there's a root cause to all that. And that's just, mm-hmm. I, I, I go back to parenting. Why aren't some of these parents handling their business at home? Yeah. Well, now everyone's afraid to handle their business at home. Yeah. They're afraid. Let you me know, tell you something. Afraid. My mom was not afraid. And, you know, oh, no, I know. <laughs> hey, hey, look, hey, I don't know if you know what a chancla is, right? And that is, it's a sandal. And, and I'm not talking those little flimsy little ones. Let me tell you, she was good at that. Okay. <laughs> My mother was not afraid. And, and that, you know, what's, what's, I never was lacking in a moral compass because I knew there was consequences that needed to be paid. All right. You know? Right. And, and so... Plus, Go Everyone ahead. needs to be aware. That's that's something that's very important in our society that people tend to forget about. There are no consequences anymore. Consequences are out the window. Yeah, you can get away with anything. A lot of excuses are being made. Mm-hmm. Look, I, I heard of a guy who got his car stolen, and the excuse he gave was because the guy stole the car because the kid was poor. <laughs> like it's I mean, acceptable. And, oh, it's and, okay. Yeah. And they excuse it. But, you know, uh, there's no excuse for that. There's no excuse. And look, let's, let's, let's go both ways, though, too, man. As law enforcement officers, we also need to hold ourselves accountable. Don't you agree? Oh, a thousand percent. Absolutely. I'll never say, you know, differently about that as well. For sure. Percent. Accountability goes both ways. Look, in law enforcement, I couldn't stand to hear when, when a cop would brag about hurting somebody. Mm-hmm. Couldn't stand it. And, and look, I had to hurt people, but I never bragged about it. It was right. part of the, it was the, 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 the suspect basically uh, made a decision on what level of force I was going to use, right? Mm-hmm. But that's one thing that's always bothered me, man. Is that something you guys see uh, nowadays in police work where um, certain officers perhaps, you know, brag about having hurt someone? And, and if so, what are cops doing about that today? You know, luckily, I have not been in a situation like that. Okay. And if I have been... There will be some words exchanged, you know, that's for sure. For sure. You know, that's for sure. It's, um, you know, we got to be careful what we do out there. Yeah. Number one, we got to be really careful what we do with all the cameras and everything being on us. But we also have to, about, have to think about our actions, right? You know, sure. we have to always make sure that we're doing the right thing within the law. And for the most part, we all do. You know, we all do. And people forget that we're all human. You know, everyone mis- makes mistakes sometimes. But we are held to a different standard, right? We're law enforcement. We're held to a very different standard with everything. Um, but, you know, there's always bad eggs. 
And that's in every single job, everything across the entire nation, there's always bad eggs. So for people to always say, because of one bad egg, everyone's the same, it's horrible to put us in that, in that same basket. You're absolutely right, man. And look, there are bad eggs out there. I've seen mm-hmm. them, you know, and, and, and uh, look, I became a cop because of a bad egg, you know, and, and because uh, my father had dealt with a bad egg, you know, when I was a kid and had, had came across one of those bad eggs. And I wanted to be the guy who was who was not the bad egg, you know. Right. And so, um, you have, look, we have to hold ourselves accountable. We, we have to hold each other accountable. I'm not talking, although, you know, full circle on somebody, but I'm talking about let's hold each other accountable. I mean, if we don't hold each other accountable, uh, we might as well be, we might as well be just be party to that. Yeah. yeah we might right. as well be party to that. And, and so and it's hard to talk about that sometimes because. You, you're, you're diming your guy out. But if you have a sidebar conversation with the guy and you let him know, hey, listen, that type of behavior was unacceptable. You know, this is how we do things. This is how we do things. And, and, and hopefully, you know, the officer, he or she realizes that he got caught up in that moment for, for, for a brief time, you know. Mm-hmm. And so because we owe it to each other to, to give law enforcement a good name. 99% of the cops out there are squared away guys and girls who start off the career uh, with good intentions. Uh, life happens, injuries happen, shootings happen, violence happens, administration happens. But you, you're the guy wearing the badge. We wear the white hat, right? Mm-hmm. We wear the white hat. And, and so it's up to us to, to really be the voice for the good guys. You're right. What, <laughs> what, is, what is the out in the East Coast? What is, what is that attitude like amongst law enforcement today? You know, I wish there was a stronger camaraderie amongst law enforcement. You know, it was, it was very strong, especially when I was young, you know, growing up and hearing my father's stories about how everyone was so tight knit and everything. Now it's still, it's still very tight, but it's not like it used to be. Mm-hmm. And I wish it was, to be honest. You know, I wish that camaraderie was a lot stronger than it is. It's still a great family. I mean, we see it every day when someone does get hurt, when someone is injured, uh, you know, there's a death or there's an illness, you know, something, something with the family. Everyone comes together and that camaraderie is there instantly. Yeah. But it goes back to, you know, the suicide prevention and yeah. all those different things that everyone's going through. The camaraderie isn't there because there's too many guys that are out for themselves. Yes. You know? And you got to remember that we're a family, you know, but then blue line, right? So we're a family and we got to be out there for each other. And sometimes, sometimes it takes somebody to really have some, some guts to step up and walk up to somebody and say, Hey, I see you're going through something. Let me help you. For sure. And, and, and that, that attitude, that culture has to be, it it has to be talked about more often Uh, because as long as we approach these officers with, from a position of leadership, from a position of wanting to help, I think if we do that more often, we can, pro- we, we, we can probably be more successful with that. Leadership training is very difficult. Yeah, you know, very difficult. It's, it's, it's not a, it's a given skill. It's not a learned skill. Correct. I think leadership training in law enforcement is more management training. Yes. Yeah. There, there aren't the enough. What was that, sir? I was going to say the problem in law enforcement is management training needs to be a little bit more in depth, right? And yeah. it should be more than just a test. It should be more than just a, a quick one month, you know, review session of different things. There should be, you know, more of the, the business type aspect of things, you know, with, with management. You know, that's, right. listen, every job out there, there's so many different changes that could happen. The way the police department is, you know, it's, it's run perfectly, you know, in, in essence, it's run perfectly. It really is. Yes. But there are small minor changes that can always happen to make a huge difference, you know, Absolutely. and- you know, one day when I retire, maybe I'll come back and uh, try to make some of those changes. I never know. You know, I've spoken to different, different parts of the country to various police groups, and I share my story, how I got hurt in law enforcement, but it's all about accountability, man. It's all about being a leader. Mm-hmm. Whether police like it or not, we are community leaders is what we are. We're not community activists, but we're community leaders. And that means that the, that little kid is watching us. That a husband and wife is watching us. The community is watching us. And it's more than just carrying the badge and the gun 
and, 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 and being the man, you know, uh, and the woman, it's about being a role model. Role model, being a role model is huge. I got three kids, you know, and that's, I always try to be a role model to them so they could look up to me and my wife and make sure that they're doing everything right in their lives. But something that I've noticed right now in our society is people are trying to be that role model just for the camera. Yeah. In, just for the example. camera. And that's, that's not true to who they are. Give me I mean, example. how many times, you know, I'll use a perfect example. It was Memorial Day, right? Mm-hmm. The other day. Yeah. And, you know, it was great that so many people were out there honoring those who we lost, right? To protect their freedom. Yes. But there were a lot of photo opportunities, you know, and I look at those photos and I say, is that photo a real photo or was that an opportunity? Yeah. You know, and sometimes people do those things, especially now it's for the likes on Facebook, the likes on Instagram is to get the news out there and get all of that. But it's when you take that, that video of that cop down the block, that's walking that old lady and you're on a roof and you're videotaping the sunset. And all of a sudden you see a cop walking an old lady across the street and you videotape that he was not, or she was not doing that for the camera. Correct. And that's a true leader. Correct. That's a true leader. And we need more of those. We definitely need more of those. You know, that's something that you can't. Yeah. You can't teach that. You can't. It's, it's all about, we are in fact servant leaders. We are the Mm -hmm. guys we're like the A-10 pilots, right? We come down, we take the hits so the guys on the ground can, can fight, get, get in the fight. You know, we're, we're the, the cops are the ones who take the hits in society so that people can live free, so people can sleep well at night. Mm-hmm. But let's just face it, man. Cops are out there because somebody's got to get the boogeyman. 100%. That's the job. 100%. That's it. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of serving but when it comes down to protecting, we're the guy who they call when it comes down to get the boogeyman because nobody Always. else wants to do that. And sometimes Always. it doesn't look very pretty. Sometimes it is ugly. There's blood involved. There's words that are exchanged. It's very violent. Mm-hmm. So, long as, so long as police understand and don't forget the escalation and de-escalation of force – and you act in good faith, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. One of the lessons that I learned early on when I first got into law enforcement was for us to focus on the things we have control over. That's a big statement. My man, if we can just focus on what we can control, everything else is out of our control. We can control the words that come out of our mouth. We can control the amount of force that we use, we can control those things. We can't control what the bad guy is going to do, nope. but, but we can rebut it. And so sometimes people, the community don't understand that. They, they, don't, they don't understand that. It's a tough world, man. And, and police are the last line of defense in our community. Much love and respect for our law enforcement, which kind of takes me into another issue. I call it, you know, people call it post-traumatic stress syndrome, PTSD, et cetera. Look, I went through all that stuff, man. I went through all that stuff. Lack of sleep, drinking, you, you name it. Medication, everything because of injuries and stuff like that. But in the end, it's about post-traumatic success. Because when somebody, when, when cops are going through that sort of thing, they have to understand that if they have a clear understanding between good and evil, what's right and wrong, and my advice to those guys who are dealing with that and the guys you talk to, just be clear on that. And everything else will sort of fall into play. Mm-hmm. When, when you, through your organization, uh, run into that, those situations of PTSD, PTS, et cetera, what are you guys doing about it out there? With the NYPD or with Fund the First? NYPD. So PTSD, that, like I said, there's units for that, that okay. control that. Got it. You know, there's, there's early intervention, you know, most of the time when something like that happens, a lot of these people, they close themselves off and they don't want to speak about things. So most people, believe it or not, there are a lot of people that do it. They'll pick up the phone and they'll call one of these units and they'll say, you know, X, Y, Z, he or she is going through whatever. And that unit will either call or they'll come down to the precinct and they'll talk to the whole group to not alienate to one person and pull them out aside. But now what does that do sometimes? Sometimes 
And this is something that those units will tell you by coming down and speaking to a group of people. And if someone in that group is going through something, sometimes that brings them to the boiling point. Yeah. You know? And it's, it's sad. It really is sad. And instead of them at that point to just ask for help, they go to the next, you know, next level and they do it in their lives. And it's really, really, really sad. But, you know, with all these different units out there, there's so much help, so much. And people need to be able to utilize it. Don't worry about my guns are going to be taken away. So what? So what? Let them be taken away, get the help that you need, and then come back. That's Absolutely. It. Yeah. That's it. So what? Who cares what the job thinks? You know what? You need to take care of yourself. Absolutely. Look, if you sit there and let that, those thoughts, those ideas uh, linger long enough in your head, they eventually make their way to your, to your heart. Mm-hmm. And, they, and then they settle in your heart. And what happens is you end, it ends up showing in the way you, you live, the way you talk, the way you act. And, and, and you hold grudges and you have all these things that just make you a very sour, sour person. You know, so um, tell me about Fund the First, man. I know that Fund the First is very near and dear to your heart. You know, much respect to you for having the vision and the idea of, of realizing that this is needed, a, a way to verify where this funding is going to go uh, for these officers. And I've been to your page. Is, is it fundthefirst.com or the fundthefirst.gov? Fundthefirst.com. Yep. Fundthefirst.com. And... Um, much respect to that, man. You're, you're a visionary and, and you really, you really, uh, uh, you know, thought ahead and, and you're, you're ahead of it, man. You've got a lot of press and a bunch of news articles, uh, a bunch yeah. of, a bunch of write-ups. And so mm-hmm. I commend you for that, man. I really do. I really do. I'm sure you've done a lot of good. For you. I think you guys have raised over $1.2 million, I believe. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. I'll get into all of it. Yeah, absolutely. Tell, tell me about the, yeah. tell me about fund the first. Yeah, I'll definitely. Yeah. You know, I just want to start, stay really quick. You know, thanks Please. for talking about police stuff. You know, police stuff is, it's important for people to realize that we're all human, right? Yes. We're all human. We're all there for each other. And we're here to protect first and foremost, you know, and that's really important that everyone needs to be aware of. And one day, whenever I retire, I want to come back on the show because then I'll really open up. Yeah. Let's talk yeah. about some more. But, um, but you're yeah, holding so back, you're holding back. I am just a little, <laughs> just a little. So, uh, yeah, let's get into fun the first. You can't share my screen? Bro, by all means. Okay, I'm going to share my... Uh-oh, I can't. Host disabled. You disabled me. Don't worry about it. Okay, okay. so let, let's talk about it. Please. So, when I was working in narcotics, and before I even get into it, a lot of good things always come out of a hardship, right? And mm-hmm. it's unfortunate that that happens, but it's always for the, the better, the greater cause, the bigger picture. It's to help more people. When I was in narcotics, and this was back in um, oh, 2017, right before um, my daughter was born, my middle child, one of my closest friends in narcotics, Jason Stocker, his daughter was also born a twin. Um, her name was Callie. And she was born two days apart from my daughter. And when a close friend of yours is, is, has a child, what do you want to do? You want to go through milestones. Hey, who's talking first? Who's eating, who's sure. eating this? Who's pooping? Who's, you know, right. How are you wiping the diapers? You know, what, are you, yeah. what the hell are you doing? You know, all that stuff. Yeah. So his daughter was born with a rare illness called Alexander's mm. disease. It's only affected about 140 people since it's, it's been identified in the 1940s. Wow. And it was really sad and really hard six months in to see Jason, his wife, his son, and now his daughter going through a serious medical and financial hardship. And, you know, like any friend, you're going to do whatever you can to try to put a smile on their face and help them out. Right. And I looked at them and I said to Jason, I said, Jason, let's get you on one of these crowdfunding platforms. Let's do a GoFundMe. Let's do a, a Fundly, whatever it is, one of these yeah. crowdfunding platforms. Yeah. Let's do a fundraiser for you. And let's raise you some money and get you that support. He looks at me and he says, no. He says, I don't want to do that. I said, okay, why? He goes, I don't want someone cross country or in a different country using my daughter's name to benefit off of our hardship. And I said, Jason, and this was three years ago. Well, now almost four years ago. I said, Jason, that doesn't happen. There's no way. He's like, Bobby, look into it. It happens. You're a detective. You're a businessman. You got the background. Look into it. Yeah. Oh, what did I do? I looked into it. (laughs) You know, I looked into it and I pulled data. Data is everything, right? Data is everything. I use keywords, keyword searches. We did a whole data pull of 
of a, a sample size of campaigns. And we noticed of that sample size of campaigns that we pulled with keywords for our target audience was first responders, military, medical professionals, you know, the whole, the whole um, spectrum. Yeah. That 3% of campaigns were duplicates. Now, what that means is we can't identify through a data poll which ones are fraud, right, or scams. But we can identify through a data poll that you, Lou, were doing a fundraiser for Cali and me, Robert, was doing a fundraiser for Cali also. Mm. I were there too. There's no verification. There's no vetting. How do you know that I'm not pocketing that money and you're actually the one giving the money to the family? Got it. There's no way of showing that. None. So I put pen to paper right when I, right when I realized that I said, you know what? I looked at the entire industry. The entire industry has 191 donation based platforms out there. There's a lot, wow. you know, a lot of, a lot of platforms that no one's ever heard of before, but amongst those there's 600 million campaigns. That's 10,000 campaigns created a day. There's a lot of money flowing through these things and a lot of fraud and scam, a lot and a lot of duplicate campaigns. So I said, I got to do something. I got to do something. And what's near and dear to me, First responders, military, medical professionals. How are we going to do this? And that's where Fund the First came. Fund the First came in, and we wanted to be, make sure that we were the only verified crowdfunding fundraising platform out there. And what we did was we partnered with ID.me. I'm sure you've heard of ID.me. Mm -hmm. ID.me is a verification processor. They're actually building out another layer of the internet, all based on verification, which is huge. It's really great what they're doing. Blake Hall over there, he's former military, incredible, incredible CEO. I learn a lot from him. I speak to him all the time. He's a great person. But um, so we partnered with ID.me and we ensure a trusted experience. And what we do is we verify every single beneficiary of campaigns. So not only do the, does the organizer and the beneficiary have trust, but now a donor coming to the platform understands that that money is only going to that beneficiary. Got and it. that's important. So it took a while to develop and entrepreneurial, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes behind that developing. Yeah you know, raising capital, all that kind of good stuff, putting together a team. And when we finally launched July of last year, we're, we're approaching July 4th is our, is our one year anniversary. Wow. So it's pretty new then. Very, very, very new. Wow. So we, wa we launched July 4th of 2020 and it's been quite an experience. We're now, we're almost at 200 campaigns on the platform. Through those 200 campaigns, we've raised almost $1.3 million. So the average campaign on that platform does raise around, you know, $10,000. However, there are campaigns that raise zero. There are campaigns that have raised a hundred grand. It all depends on now crowdfunding and fundraising works in a way where you have to share it with your network. And that's right. really important. People have to get an emotional connection just because fund the first our company does do social media posts and all that kind of stuff. Someone won't be emotionally connected to it as much as they would if they knew that person, you know, that's going through the hardship. And it's not always about hardship. It's about illness, surgery, death, catastrophic loss, fundraiser for a good cause, a equipment for a department. Nonprofits can do fundraisers on a platform, such as Tunnel to Towers can come to our platform and do a fundraiser right on it, you know, which is great. We, we verify the EINs and the address and everything that we need to with a nonprofit organization. Yeah. We have business ventures. So if you've heard of Kickstarter, we built a Kickstarter in, engine into our platform because there's so many first responders, military and medical professionals that have businesses, but they don't know how to raise capital. So instead of raising capital, why not do a donation-based donation tier system? and give something away for a donation. It's pretty okay. cool. Uh, so we've developed that. Go so ahead. give me some examples of some of your, uh, some of the victories you've had there. Some of the people, uh, obviously you don't have to disclose names or whatever, but give me some examples of the uh, cases where you guys have helped a lot of people, some people. Yeah. So, well, let me first start off by saying every case is a victory. You know, for, sure. for someone to, for someone to come up to our platform and have the courage to start something and publicly put it out there. That's all it takes. That's step number one. That's victory right there, right? Because they have the courage and they have the, you know, the wherewithal to really put themselves out there and do something or do something for someone else. And that's really important for people to understand. Now, our platform has had a ton of, so to say, victory. We've had now almost 13,000 unique donors come to the platform. Wow. And we also have almost 5,000 registered users. It's great. We've been in the news almost 100, over 100 times now. I saw and that's that. Not, yeah, it's not little news. We've, I mean, I've been on Fox and Friends multiple times, OAN, Newsmax, CBS, NBC, you name it. You know, yeah. we've been, you know, and it's important for the name recognition, but it's not enough. We need to be a household name. You know, our nation's heroes, those who serve, they need to know that we exist and we need to be a household name, you know? So, so what can people who watch this, what can they do to help? What can they do to help you become a household name? Yeah, I mean, share is everything. 
you know, and not only is, is the share everything, and let me backtrack for a second before I get into how can people help. Some of the, the cases that we've had, and I call them cases because that's a detective of me, and I apologize. Yeah, yeah. But uh, <laughs> some of the campaigns that we've had on the platform, you know, they range. And we've had a lot of line of duty death campaigns, a lot. And it's really, really sad to go through those. But do you know how we get those campaigns? It's not always about, you know, them seeing us and, and knowing about us through social media or the news. It's actually me and our team picking up the phone. I do this every single day. I see a death, an illness, a surgery, whatever it is across the spectrum of, our, of those who serve. I pick up the phone and I call those departments right away. I try to find their families on social media. And I basically say this, I'm an NYPD detective. I understand what you're going through. Let me just explain to you that the last thing that we want to see is someone in your network all of a sudden start a fundraising campaign on some other platform, you not know about it, and them pocketing that money. That's the last thing we want to see. So our platform is here. The beneficiary must be verified. If it's a widow or widower, we will verify you. We have a process for that. You know, so that's that's important for people to know that we do this organic outreach all day long. We're on the phones. We're getting to these departments. This this officer that was just uh, killed in uh, San Bernardino, right? Uh, yesterday, I was yeah. on the phone with the department all morning. Wow. All morning, I was on the phone with them. They may not use the platform, which is fine but it's making them aware of why we exist. And I'm not trying to coerce anybody to use our platform. I just let them know that we're here to support them. And that's it, that's it. And they always wanna hear more. And if they don't use it, that's fine because what ends up happening, someone in the family, a niece, nephew, whatever, starts a campaign. And it's like, well, we didn't approve that. Right, you know? right on. So, yeah, but, but in order to get to that household name, in addition to the organic outreach and all the media that we have and everything we're doing, we need the shares. We need people to come to our platform, see what we're doing, understand that it is fully trusted. It's fully vetted. It's ran by first responders and military. I mean, even though I have a vast business background, our team has business backgrounds, we are first responders. You know, we're there. We've lived it or we live it, you know, and we understand exactly what everyone's going through. And that's important. You know, it's important for our community to understand, you know, don't go to one of these other platforms and don't use them because they don't care. They get politically motivated or, yeah. you know, they don't care about what you're going through. They care about, they care about the money that's coming in and that's it. We care. Right. We're right. there to support you. Every single one of our campaigns, and you could ask every single one, there's 195 campaigns. I have personally spoken to every single one, every single one. Oh, man. And I know every single one because I want them to know that I'm here and I will help them no matter what. Even yeah. the ones that raise zero dollars, I try to push them and help them. Hey, do this, do that, do this. Our team does the exact same thing. And that's important because it's family. You know, oh, really. Is so people, you know, come to the, come, if you come to the website at fundthefirst.com, all of our social media is at fundthefirst. You could email me directly. I'll give my email. It's rgarland at fundthefirst.com. And it's actually on our website, on our, on our team page as well. You can get my phone number if you want. I don't care. Call me. If it's in the middle of the night, you need something, call me. Text me, whatever it is. It's perfectly fine. Let me ask you this, man. So you got 13 years in the job. Yep. How many years are you going to do? Well, always 20 and out, right? 20 and out. <laughs> is it 20? A, it's 20 for me. It's 20. The new guys, it's I think 25. Got um, it. What's next but, for you after that? Well, I mean, business is everything. Okay. You know, business is everything. I, I, I am an entrepreneur at heart. You know, I have a, a big spirit, but it's not just about chasing the dollar. Yeah. It's about chasing, chasing that dream to help others. And that's really important to me because we've, it's not, we haven't only developed Fund the First. We've developed a nonprofit organization supporting line of duty deaf families, which is, which is at the fallenfirstreserve.org. And we also have another platform that we're launching that coincides with Fund the First. I can't reveal it yet. That's okay. coming out soon. Right but, on, um, man. Yeah, that's, that's helping a whole uh, different aspect of people as well but business i mean listen if after after the police department you know and still staying with fund the first you know i'm big into into venture capital big into trading big into stocks big into cryptocurrency you know i actually believe it or not i would love to open up my own venture capital firm you know get the right people together to do that that's a that's a big thing that i'm really heavily into and i love the you know, to see, I don't know if you're familiar with, and I didn't even know this, you know, I, I've always known about venture capital, but you know why venture capital was created? Why is that? It was actually after the wars, after World War II, military was coming back 
and they didn't have the funds to get their businesses started. And that's where venture capital came into play. Oh, right man. So, that, really, so that's really cool. So that's part of your, your next. I think so. Yeah, right on. I think so. Is and your, the kids, is base, your, uh, on the kids. <laughs> your father, is he still alive? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, he got Proud three quarters and I hope so. <laughs> I, I hope bet so. he, he is, got, man. Yeah, yeah. He got three quarters in 95. He runs the, the local little league over here. I do it with him. You know, it's a big program. It's great. I mean, my brother plays for the twins, so it's pretty cool. He's in double A right now. Nice. So, uh, yeah, it's nice. I right know, um, man. Well, look, I want to thank you for your time. I, I want to thank you for, for uh, uh, being a voice for law enforcement and, and uh, being a voice for those who can't, who can no longer speak for themselves, uh, for the families who don't have a platform to speak for themselves. Now, I want to thank you for that. Uh, and I also want to uh, ask you to still to continue being a leader amongst uh, leaders in law enforcement, because without the good men and women like yourself in law enforcement, uh, things are going to get tough. You know, and, 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 and things are going to get tougher, but it takes people like yourself who aren't afraid to lead and, and, and point out when things are being done wrong and praise when things get done right. And so I want to thank you, man. I really want to do thank you. Thank you for your time. And, and uh, um, I'm glad you put the other fund to first. And I look forward to uh, uh, seeing what's next for you in your future. And, and, uh, uh, and much success to you and your wife, and I look forward maybe on my next trip to New York, having a cup of coffee with you, man, and, and uh, get to know you. And, 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 and I, look, I look forward to see what your career takes you. Outstanding. Lou, thank you so much. It was definitely a pleasure to be on your show. I appreciate you, man. Again, it's fundafirst.com. And we'll be sure to post that right here as well. And, and people can go in there and they can either donate to a, to a particular case. They can pick whether it's military, uh, first responder, law enforcement, et cetera. I know there's different options in there. They can help mm-hmm. contribute to a, to a case that's, that, they fi- that they find near to their heart. So, again, thank you so much, Robert Garland, and uh, one of NYPD's finest detectives, right? And uh, it's a real pleasure, man, to meet you. And uh, I've heard great things about you. Again, much success to you. And I look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you, Lou. All right. Thank you very much.